Hello and welcome. My name is Robert O'Byrne, and today I'm introducing the first in a series of conversations with gardeners and garden historians. This is all by way of preparation for an exhibition that the Irish Georgian Society will be hosting in the City Assembly House next September on the subject of Irish country house gardens, their history and development. Today, I'm in the wonderful National Botanic Gardens with the Palm House directly behind me here. And I'm going to be speaking with the garden's director, Dr. Matthew Jebb. I hope you enjoy what follows. Matthew, thank you so much for uh, meeting me today here uh, in your natural territory. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, answer me this, first of all. Are you a botanist or a horticulturist or both or neither? I'm a botanist who has become you know, fascinated by horticulture as a means to continue the study of botany. So the, these two subjects very much, you know, two sides of the same coin. Mm. Mm. Yes, I mean, one is, so to speak, theoretical and the other is practical. Yes. Is that yeah. a fair assessment? It's a fair assessment. And one of the, the points of, of horticulture is it's a tremendous science in itself. The science of horticulture is uh, growing a plant and seeing how it prospers and, and you need to constantly be changing your, the medium you grow it in, the habitat, the conditions you're applying to it. So the, the skill of the horticulturalist is learnt by handling plants the whole time, mm. repotting them, growing them, and um, bringing them to their full life cycle. So it's a vital part of what we do here. You cannot have a botanical gardens without the application of horticulture. No, because otherwise you'd just be sitting in a library all day. <laughs> and you wouldn't need to have any plants. Yes. <laughs> so your career, you started, where did you start working? Somewhere exotic, as I recall. Well, exactly. My first sort of proper job was out in Papua New Guinea in the South Pacific. And that was after many years of, of study at Oxford University originally. And then my PhD involved traveling all over the Pacific, New Guinea, Indonesia, um, Fiji, and collecting plants, which the, then was the, the, the basis of my training in taxonomy, which is the, the study of the naming of things. So the naming of living things is still something that uh, continues to this day. A lot of people feel, well, we've discovered the whole world. Geographically, we may have, but the biological life on this planet is still far from properly understood. Yes, we have, as you said, a very temperate, humid climate. And as a result, plants from all over the world come here. And we'll come on to that in a little while when we're talking about country house gardens. But you've been here at the Botanic Gardens for some time? 25 years now, yes. So I, I started here as the taxonomist working in the herbarium because we have another institution here, if you like, which is the National Herbarium, a collection of nearly three quarters of a million pressed dried plants, mm -hmm. which form our knowledge of the, the natural world. It's, it's the basis of naming of plants, but also understanding their distribution and so on. Uh, and one of my roles here as the uh, keeper of the herbarium was to look after the nomenclature of plants in the collection. So I got to learn the collections very nicely. I didn't have any administrative role at that time. And it meant I could wander about, look at the plants, which is you know, the basis of a botanic gardens is it's a, a, a educational journey. Every time you walk here, you're passing plants, which through the year are coming into flower, fruiting and so on. So you, you get to learn their whole sort of history and life cycle. Because this is in some ways, it's a laboratory really, isn't it? Yes, and it's, and it's a classroom too. It's um, like the peripatetic schools of ancient Greece where People wandered about thinking of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Here you can wander about and think about botany and, and horticulture. You can see the skills of what a horticulturist can do, what kind of plants will grow in an Irish climate. And that is something you know, that our gardeners here are providing, not in a very overt way, but it is there for everyone to see how to cultivate plants. So it's rather Rousseau-esque. You're a philosopher king here at Botanic Gardens. Yes, and it is, it's, you know, even when I'm traveling overseas in China or something, and I might be opening a flower under a, a hand lens, I will be, in my mind, drawn back to the order beds here at, at Glasnevin to understand which family it might mm. be placed into. Mm. So that, that knowledge of a, a sort of, Lay, laying something out geographically is very useful to the human brain, the human mind. 
And the plants here, you're always adding more to, oh, because you're limited by space. How big is the how big is the botanic garden? We're limited to 50 acres here, of which a lot is um, nursery area, which right. is the sort of powerhouse of the gardens. And we propagate the plants we have here already, but we also get in uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of new uh, plants every year. And that will come in as packets of seed from all over the world, expeditions uh, to the sort of headquarters, if you like, of, of wild nature, and exchanges with other botanic gardens. And yet, our collection stays more or less the same, which tells you just how many plants actually die. And that is normal. You know, we don't sort of say that a plant will live forever. We've got to propagate it to keep it going. And to keep a plant forever, as they say, the best thing to do is to give it away. Because <laughs> that other person will hopefully keep it alive. And exactly. you can get and it there'll returned. be ongoing propagation. And, and yes. so, the, the, quite literally, the roots will spread out. Yes. Yes. So now, the Botanic Gardens... To give us a little bit of a background history. They, they, it dates, the original site here dates from the late 18th century. Yes, it was um, an extraordinary uh, midwife surgeon, Walter Wade, practicing uh, medicine here in Dublin. And of course, if you, if you practice medicine at such times, you were an intimate of botany because that is where the materia medica, mm. uh, medical materials came from plants, medicinal plants. Um, he realized you know, what Ireland needs is its own botanic gardens. We saw across the waters there, Kew, the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew had set up, and it was a powerhouse in a way for empire there. Uh, uh, the bounty had been sent out to the Pacific to bring breadfruit back. These were the, the, the way that empire would spread tropical crops around the world. But here in Dublin, what was needed was um, the opportunity to advance both horticultural and botanical knowledge. And Walter Wade approached John Foster, the last speaker of the Irish Houses of Parliament, who was in a very good position to help him with preparing a bill. And indeed, John Foster put before the Irish Houses of Parliament in uh, 1795 a bill to establish a botanic gardens. And here, Glasnevin was selected. An unfortunate choice because, <laughs> as uh, later curators pointed out, you know, this is a dry, uh, calcareous ridge which suffers from being in a frost pocket as well. So, had you. Uh, so every conceivable drawback. It, it, yes, and, yes and no. And, and therefore, you know, adversity often breeds the greatest mm. uh, success in yeah. um, people overcoming a problem. So it's uh, interesting because John Foster himself cultivated very wonderful um, gardens and woodlands up in County Loud on his estate there. So you would have thought he would have uh, better judgment. Or was this the only site available? It was know? probably the only site available. And, and of course, all of these things, you know, at the time, there were always pragmatic decisions that have mm. to be taken. But one of the extraordinary things, John Foster, yes, he helped get that bill through the Houses of Parliament. And he was not actually um, involved with the management of this place, bar for the fact that for 30 years after its establishment, he was constantly meddling. And he was referred to as the fostering mantle because <laughs> this meddling was actually in a very good way because the Dublin Society, the Royal Dublin Society, as was then, uh, was uh, the owner and the manager of the site. But uh, John Foster made sure that he was constantly there to nudge it and steer it in the right direction. So his influence on this place for 30 years after its establishment was of profound benefit to us because Walter Wade also often felt on the back foot with mm. the Dublin Society not providing him funds or people or opportunities. And John Foster was always able to wade in and force things. The Dublin Society was initially very closely involved, which then became the Royal Dublin Society. But at a certain point, it became more of a government um, institution, the Botanic Gardens. Yes, in the middle of the 19th century, the uh, gardens were was handed over for, to government control rather than sitting in the Dublin Society. But prior to that, uh, before the establishment of the gardens, there had been attempts to establish and start a Botanic Gardens here in Dublin which John Foster had actually opposed. And the reason he had opposed them was that both himself and Walter Wade had a certain anti-intellectual uh, bent to them. What they did not want was this garden to fall into the hands of 
academics and intellectuals. They felt Othnian horticulture was for everybody. It should be a national institution. And um, the original ideas had come from a triumvirate of Trinity College, the Royal College of Sciences, and the Dublin Society. So they had vigorously opposed that, mm. and they wanted the Dublin Society as, as an organization uh, really involved in the promotion of agricultural science and the economy, the agricultural economy. You know, this was the best sort of home for mm. the botanic gardens. Mm. Yes, I mean, certainly the Dublin Society gave prizes to people for agricultural innovations and for planting different trees and so forth, as we know. Um, <clears throat> but once it became a, a, a formal government um, institution, uh, the, the nature of the director, although the title was something different there, fundamentally begins to change as well? Yes, because throughout our history, depending really very much on the um, characteristics of the whether it was the curator, keeper, or director of the time, um, their interests. So sometimes agriculture has been in the ascendancy here, and at other times, you know, botanical knowledge. And these two need to be kept um, really as, as partners, sisters in this mm. collaboration of botany and, and horticulture. So when we were first established, the Dublin Society ensured that we had gardens for sheep, swine, cattle, horses. And these were plants that were both uh, good for these animals, but also injurious to them. Mm. We had dyer's gardens, uh, medicinal plant displays, very practical mm. Um, mm. botany, which in a way is what a botanic garden is always uh, historically originated from, a physic garden for physicians to acquire their medicinal plants. Precisely. And then today, you know, we find ourselves very much at the forefront of uh, the conservation and preservation, both of plants internationally, but also nationally within Ireland. So the National Herbarium provides us with the, the knowledge and the background of understanding our flora intimately. Uh, David Moore, uh, a director in the early part of the 19th century, <laughs> very, very much interested in the Irish flora, the, the wild plants of Ireland. Uh, his son, Frederick, Sir Frederick Moore, far more interested in, in the exotics. And all of these add to a wonderful sort of tapestry of history here over the past two and a bit centuries. Now, you know, <coughs> excuse me, that the Irish Jordan Society is very much focused on encouraging this year appreciation of country house gardens. And you know, we've mentioned, for example, that John Foster himself had an estate, had a country house garden. So there's always been links between the botanic gardens and country house owners at, with the development of their own gardens. And that's particularly the case, I think, in the 19th century with the two moors, father and son. Yes, and one of the important things to recognize about Glasnevin is it was you know, the premier place for training of horticulturalists in the country. So uh, throughout the 19th century, the training of uh, gardeners here to provide such expertise to all the big estates around the country was a very important aspect. And not only that, but both David Moore, and especially Sir Frederick Moore, uh, spent a great deal of time staying on these estates as, as um, house guests, but imparting knowledge, sharing plants freely, uh, advice freely. And this was you know, an aspect of the gardens under Frederick Moore that actually has, has come back to be of enormous benefit to us today because a lot of the collections of new plants that were pouring in from around the world from the sort of 18. 70s, 1880s, mm, right mm. through to the 1920s. This was a, a river of, of biological novelties and diversity uh, that still survived largely intact in a lot of these old domains. Particularly in the 19th century, there were, of course, close links between country house owners, as we mentioned, and the botanic gardens, not least because quite often some of those house owners who had large estates would have been involved with or helped sponsor expeditions going to places like China, to the Americas and so forth, in search of new plants, new species, to see if they could grow them here in Ireland. Yes, the end of the 19th century especially saw a sort of golden age of plant collecting where syndicates would get together. So uh, multiple uh, garden owners, both in Ireland and Britain, would sponsor expeditions specifically to hunt and collect seeds and send them back to their collections. So this was a lucrative source of fantastic novelty from the garden point of view. 
And it was originally based purely on economics. Harry Vetch and, and co. in London had brought back the sequoia dendron, the mammoth tree, mm. and you know every big estate wished to plant these huge American giant trees towering 300 foot tall. These were you know real prizes, and therefore the price matched the prize. Yeah. And um, these later expeditions, herbaceous plants, shrubs, trees from China especially was was really the the kickstarter of this whole thing. And Augustine Henry. Uh, an extraordinary Irishman who spent 18 years in China. He originally went out as a, as a doctor, a medical mm -hmm. orderly with the Imperial Maritime Customs Service. But whilst there, his interest in medicinal plants led him into botany and thus into sending back dried herbarium specimens to Kew in, in London to get them identified. So he could mm -hmm. equate the medicinal plant in China with a scientific name. And this generated such interest in, at Kew of the extraordinary number of novelties that he was exposing to Western science, long known to the Chinese apothecaries, of course, of course. but nonetheless, to put them into a, a botanical uh, hierarchy was very important. And this led to plant hunters going out in his footsteps, so mm. to speak, to begin this flow of plants. So we have people like Ernest Wilson, George Forrest, Frank Kingdon Ward, uh, mm. all of whose names are intimately connected with a lot of the plants we see around us in our gardens today, especially the big semi-mature plants that have now developed from their introductions. Augustine Henry is, is, as you say, an extraordinary character because once he got seized by uh, the botany bug, uh, he couldn't let go. He was badly infected, shall we say. And he started to travel all around China and he sent back thousands of different dried species. Well, strangely, he had great difficulty persuading his bosses that this was important. And therefore, he found himself getting up at four in the morning to do his botany before his day job began. And he had to take a leave of absence for some of his major expeditions around the uh, country where he did travel for months in the, the hinterland of uh, provinces such as Sichuan and Yunnan which were surprisingly unknown to the West because you know, China had been a very proud and large empire and it had kept Western influence right down at the coast for centuries. Um, and then when finally, you know, following the Opium Wars and really the, the destruction of the uh, you know, imperial power mm -hmm. of China, this is where we as, as horticulturalists, botanists, gardeners realized that most of the Japanese plants that we had introduced to Europe over the centuries actually had Chinese origins. Mm. It was from the central mountains of China that all this botanical richness came. And the, the reason that it's so botanically rich is that throughout the last few million years, you know, through the ice ages and so on, all of the plants of China have been able to travel south in these huge river gorges, which means that the climate at the top of the mountain and down at the bottom mm. of the river, which and some of these valleys are one mile in depth. It right. means you have got almost every climate from the tropics to the Arctic Pole. <laughs> and therefore, the plants only had to travel a few hundred meters up and down the slope to survive these huge changes mm. and shifts in the climate, which means that this botanical richness has, has evolved and survived there. Whereas here, alas, in Europe, our flora was driven down into the Mediterranean. And beyond that was the a Sahara Desert. It was, mm. It's not mm. inimical to survival of these plants. So, you know, we, we have quite a, uh, a, a paucity of wild plant species in Europe compared to the riches of the Americas and China. Nevertheless, given our climate that we've been speaking about, our humid, temperate climate, a lot of things do flourish here. And a, a lot of the plants which you now see everywhere, and I'm thinking particularly of, to some extent, the dreaded ponticum, rhododendron. Yes. Um, <coughs> You know, they were introduced initially in country house gardens, and there was great excitement about having these exotic plants, like different forms of rhododendron. Yes, and, and a great deal of, of pride and um, excitement of obtaining these new things. And one of the sort of kickstarters to this was in the 1850s, when Joseph Hooker, later to become the director of Kew, had traveled to the uh, Himalayan ranges and happened by pure chance to explore the Sikkim valleys, which 
has one of the richest rhododendron floras of the Himalaya range. And these are huge oh. trees. They're vast um, rhododendron species. And he sketched them, drew them in the field, and sent back copious quantities of seed to his oh. father uh, at Kew. Um, and it was his father who distributed these seeds to a lot of gardens such as ourselves. So we received the seed here, we grew the plants, mm. and yet Joseph Hooker was still on his way back by ship to <laughs> London when we already had the seedlings here. Yeah. And after 15 years or so of growth here, they were too big for our glass houses. And this is where you know the extraordinary opportunity came about for us to be sharing these plants. And it was David Moore who had uh, given them to estates such as uh, Kilmacurra, run mm. by the Acton family. They planted them there, and they're alive to this day as 40-foot giants, uh, equivalent, if you like, to the size they would reach in the Himalayas. In so their native it's a wonderful ground. sort of prospect of the excitement, the thrill these people had of plants that were complete novelties, and here they were able to grow them, because we couldn't put them out here. Our, our soil is too alkaline. There's mm. not enough rainfall. They needed that, uh, you know, Himalaya climate. Right, which they found which elsewhere in Ireland. In in most, most of the rest of Ireland, oddly enough, just not in this little place where the botanic gardens yes, are located. Yeah. And, and perhaps that, like I said at the beginning, that sort of adversity of our problem here meant that the Moors were very involved with sharing of plants, sharing of knowledge, training of people here. You know, and, and it was under Frederick Moore, for example, that lady gardener students were also first introduced mm. here, beating Kew and other gardens by some years. Um, you know, the first lady gardeners were taught here in the uh, uh, late 1880s, mm. and they have been significant. I mean, some of the great plant collectors and growers of the last century or so in these islands have been women. Absolutely. Yeah. And because towards the end of the 19th century, women started to become very actively involved in gardens, once particularly you, you start to develop this Robinsonian, the William Robinson idea yes. of gardens, yes. you know, with your deep beds, uh, that women became very actively involved in the design and planting of those, I think. Yes, and I suppose you know, Gertrude Jekyll was pr probably one of the foremost of these people that William Robinson formed a, a, an intimate relationship with because he realized his ideas and her ideas melded beautifully. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that you know, it was William Robinson's career was very much based upon David Moore writing him a superb reference. I mean, the story is that, you know, when William Robinson left his employers here in uh, Ireland, he left the vents open to destroy the, all of the hothouse plants because clearly he was rather a passionate man, shall we say. Mm. And he came to Dublin where David Moore wrote him a glowing reference that got him a, a posting in Regent's Park in London. And his first task was the growing of native plants, growing of British plants in Regent's Park as a, as a means of, you know, utilizing the, the plants of these islands as a, as a um, glamorous part of the gardening there. And this is really what led him into this whole idea of naturalistic plantings, which is melding native plants and exotic plants together uh, in the new combinations. And it was Gertrude Jekyll's background in art and people like Ruskin and Morris and so on, all of these great designers and mm. people who were interested in the arts and crafts movement could sort of recognize that the beauty of plants was something that was more important than a Victorian regimented mm. dominion of plants, sort of dominating plants rather than using plants for their precise beauty. Yeah, I, you know, Victor, those late Victorian gardens, which, which one still sees in urban parks and things like that, where everything is very regimented. It's all to do with um, exercising authority over nature. Whereas Robinson, who, as you mentioned, came from Ireland and from County Leash, indeed, yeah, yeah. that he, uh, he wanted to form what I almost describe as sort of an association to work with plants rather than to tell them what to do. Yes, and... One of the other things is probably he was influenced by what he saw here in Ireland. So, you know, it's an important idea that his idea of gardening was no doubt formulated from his upbringing and his association with gardening in Ireland. So the, the whole idea of herbaceous borders and using naturalistic plantings and indeed using the scenery surrounding a, a, a garden here in Ireland is something that Robinson took back to um 
to Britain. Over, over to Britain yeah. and, and really led to a revolution in gardening. Um, and so we should recognize it really as an Irish origin no, I story. Think, I think we can claim I, we yes. can claim that. You know, it's very interesting because most people's idea now of what a classical country house garden is is actually a Robinsonian garden. And as you say, his ideas were formed in the middle of, of, the, of the Irish countryside all those centuries, all that yes, time and, ago. And it, it wasn't just Robinson. I mean, Repton, William Repton of the, the Red Books, again, you know, one of the biggest influences post-Capability uh, Brown. He again spent time here in Dublin. He visited some of the big estates in Wicklow. He saw these gardens. And again, no doubt, that was a, a very influential period when he realized that the, the picturesque combined with the exotic and the, the sort of whole combination of assembling a menagerie of remarkable plants around your domain was something that was intimately part of garden building. Speaking of garden building, we cannot but mention the greenhouses here because they're such an important feature and they're one of the your main attractions, I think. Well, exactly. And, and one's often frustrated in a garden where, you know, children and so on are more is, uh, fascinated by a frog or a squirrel running about rather than all <laughs> of this beautiful um, botany that surrounds them. But you are right. The, the glass houses, again, David Moore had pushed for the construction of glass houses and this wonderful curvilinear range mm. that dominates the scene here. You know, in 1843, when that was the construction of that, began. It took 25 years to put together the entire range because, again, funding was so tight and, you know, there's that constant effort to obtain enough funds to do it. But today, that is, you know, such a jewel of a building. It is, mm. you know, one can safely say one of the best preserved wrought iron buildings in the whole of Europe, which is a tremendous claim to, for us to be able to make. And, you know, it was the Office of Public Works in the 1990s that restored that building Absolutely. entirely. Yeah. And it, you know, it was done in a faithful way. So, you know, Kieran O'Connor and his team of architects from the Office of Public Works researched how to redo it. How do we make a wrought iron building work again? Because the previous one had, had survived nicely for one and a half centuries. You know, the technology was the right thing mm. to use. And indeed, you know, we are rewarded now by looking at a building that is 25 years since its restoration. It's never been repainted and it is still looking as neat and clean as a, a new pin. And we should say that the uh, man responsible initially for creating the cross was Turner, the, who was one of the great designers of, of greenhouses and a kind of pioneer in the use of wrought iron. Yes, much like the Moore family, he, he had come over from Scotland, his ancestors uh, settled here in Dublin, but his foundry that he, he ran, the Hammersmith foundry in Balls Bridge, was highly innovative in the, the machinery he constructed. He was able to make these curved ribs in very, very gracile forms. So they're only an inch and a, a fraction of a, over an inch uh, across, which compared to cast iron or wood constructions meant they were light and airy and they were you know, internationally fated. The, the orders for his glass houses came from Britain, from France, from Germany. They were spread right across Europe and indeed to many a big country house across Ireland. Having a Turner glass house was a wonderful addition. Absolutely. It, you feel when you travel around Ireland and visit country houses and their gardens, you know that a Turner glass house was very much the peak of gardening, if you had one of those. You, you had, so to speak, in gardening terms, you'd arrived. Yes, and he was, you know, he was a great self-publicist. When uh, Queen Victoria visited uh, Dublin, he constructed a huge cast iron arch over the road mm. uh, from Dunleary into the centre of uh, the city with Q at the top, K-E-W, because he was just reminding her that he had designed the, the Q glass house. Mm. Um, and he did it here. So whilst um, Burlington is often credited with designing of the Q Palm House, we know from letters that Richard Turner actually sketched out the design for that finished structure in very early discussions with Hooker. Um, and, you know, the, to have our own copy of such a magnificent he was an architect, artisan. He was an artist of mm -hmm. his of his craft of of iron smithing, um, and it was, I think, seen by the Office of Public Works as something vital that we should not overlook this, you know, proud part of our uh, history in 
design and engineering. Absolutely. No, I, th these buildings, as much as the gardens in which they're set, are part of our heritage. And really one reflects the other because it was in those buildings that a lot of those species you were talking about were propagated and then sent out around the country by the Moors particularly. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so not only those sort of hooker rhododendrons I was mentioning, but also uh, exotic orchids and so on that Frederick Moore especially assembled here at Glasnevin, what was probably the biggest collection of tropical orchids in the world at the time. And um, the, the number of novelties that were described from grown plants here, once collected in, in Brazil or uh, India, Borneo, they were you know, not known by botanists until they flowered here at Glasnevin. So it's something like 25 species of tropical orchid were described from cultivated plants here. And Frederick Moore discovered that if he went to the big auction houses um, in London, he couldn't afford the bids that were coming in for the big flashy orchids, mm -hmm. which went up to, you know, 1,000 guineas in his lifetime. <clears throat> and that's in the 19th century. And that, that, that was the cost of uh, the ironwork in the palm house here. So... Mm. One's really talking about five million euros today being being bid for mm. a single orchid plant. And he used to go to the auction house and say, I'll take everything that's left after the sale that has <laughs> failed to uh, achieve a price. Mm. They were small orchids. They had tiny blooms. Um, but what was overlooked by the flashy owners of orchid collections, you know, became famous here at Glasnevin with this huge collection of extraordinary orchids, unknown anywhere else. And... Every single one of them, when they came into bloom, uh, Frederick Moore got them painted by this wonderful artist, Lydia Shackleton. Mm. Um, and Lydia Shackleton, who was an aunt of the Arctic, uh, Antarctic explorer, Ernest Shackleton, she used to paint each orchid flower as it came into bloom so that he always had an aid memoir to what his collection contained, which was thousands of extraordinary and sometimes unnamed orchids. Thank you very much for joining us here today. The second in this series of conversations will be available for you to watch on Friday the 25th of June when I'll be in Kilmacurra Gardens, County Wicklow, speaking to its head gardener, Seamus O'Brien. I very much hope that you'll be able to join us then. And in the meantime, stay safe, everyone, and goodbye.